Uh, thanks everyone for coming to our research talk. Um, Edgar is going to uh, be the main presenter. Uh, Edgar was a PhD student with um, me and Andreas Tolias uh, at Baylor College of Medicine. He's now a postdoc um, with Fabian Sins at the University of Tübingen. Uh, our other collaborator on this work is James Cotton, who is uh, at Northwestern. Uh, so Edgar is going to present this paper for uh, maybe 30 minutes approximately, and uh, mm -hmm. hopefully we'll leave enough time for question and answer. Uh, you can already uh, start answering your, entering your questions in the, in the Q&A. And uh, if everything works as intended, you should be able to upvote, um, see and upvote uh, other people's questions. I, I just um, make sure that that's said. Um, and then if you have general discussion, uh, for example, uh, with other attendees, then you can just type it into the chat. Okay, uh, enjoy and Edgar, you have the floor. All right. All right, so let me get started. Uh, but before I dive into the main part of the talk, I actually wanted to take the time to uh, note the unfortunate news of Professor Horace Barlow passing away yesterday and uh, take this time to be able to know some of the inspirational work he has done. It's been a truly inspiring and influential computational and system neuroscientist. And obviously, as many of you know, has laid many, many of the foundational concepts and theories on how the brain processes and computes the sensory information from concepts of redundancy reduction to invariance to do in the face of the noise to encoding of certain information, which is obviously a very influential and has been a relevant topic for the very work I'm about to present today. Edgar, just a so technical on, remark. So somebody is saying that um, there's a lot of echo on your side. Is there any way that you can try to reduce that? Yeah, that's been a bit hard. It's just uh, room design. Let me try to talk closer to the mic and see if that helps. Might help. And maybe uh, uh, talking slightly slower might also help. Thank you. OK, sure. Let me try the other mic and see if that helps at all. I'll try my best then. Yeah, I'm not trying to talk too fast. Then. All right. Oh, this, so, is very, this is not, not very loud. No. All right. One second. Let me just quickly check the audio settings and see if I can help with that. Uh, any better? This, this is okay, I think. Yeah. Is this okay? All right. I'll, I'll try to see how much it does with it. All right, then uh, I'll try to get started. So uh, thanks again. Once again, thanks for the opportunity to present my work today with Wei Ji. And uh, well, I thought I'll always start with a brief introduction by myself, but Wei Ji pretty much gave the whole information away, so I'll be very brief on this point. Once again, my name is Edgar Walker. I'm a computational theoretical uh, system neuroscientist as well as a machine learning researcher, currently working as a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Fabian Sinsblad here in the University of Tübingen, Germany. Uh, also, as a fun side, I'm uh, main, one of the main developers for this uh, open source software called Data Joint for building pipelines for data science. And I'm also a co founder of a company called Bates, which provides service around this open source software. So, among many things that keeps on driving me forward and be fascinated about my research, one of my main fascination lies in understanding what, what really drives, uh, what really underlies the brain's, uh, brain's ability to arrive at the complex decisions and behaviors in response to sensory information, especially despite the fact it's filled with uncertainty. And perhaps nothing illustrates this point better than actually seeing the brain in action, and of course, nothing better than cat responding to a piece of cucumber. So there's already a lot going on, as we can imagine. When the, when the cat is presented with an image of cucumber, the image hits the retina, leading to neurons and visual sensory areas, so such as V1, to fire vigorously. And subsequently, the information is further propagated down to the upper brainstorm area to ultimately lead to behavior, in this case, the jumping. And this simplified diagram here already captures the essence of this brain's computation from the stimulus S to sensory populations such as V1 response R to decision and behavior B. And my long-standing goal as a system neuroscientist has been in understanding every step of this information flow. And particularly as we do this, we tend to break this up into two components focusing on the first part of uh, stimulus leading to response as the encoding, and then the second part of how the rest of the brain utilizes this information to arrive at the behavior as the decoding. 
And particularly as my approach has been to study the encoding aspect through the system identification process and decoding through the heavy use of probability and theories of probabilistic computation. And in the rest of the work I'll talk today, I'll focus on the second half of decoding, particularly as Wei Jin mentioned, highlighting our recent work on studying how population in, uh, of neurons in a visual cortex in macaque might be encoding uncertainty information. Now, considering that this is a mixed audience, I believe from ranging from heavy neuroscience to any data science, there will be slides that will contain some technical details that will be interesting to some, but I've made it so that's not essential to understand the talk. These slides are indicated by titles and parentheses, as well as a black star on the top right corner to make it obvious. All right, so with that, again, just revisiting the point from earlier, uh, cat responding and jumping back to the cucumber, but that naturally brings us to the question of, oh, why did the cat jump up after all? Is this a natural reaction to cucumber? Well, these appears that it's actually fairly common behavior and not just specific to this one cat I happened to find on the internet. And uh, one popular explanation is that, well, perhaps cucumber looks similar enough to a snake. But it turns out they're, when they're not caught by surprise, they don't necessarily jump up to cucumber. So it's not like they equivalent snake to cucumber all the time. And I really believe that the key difference in behavior here lies in the difference in the uncertainty associated with the visual observation. And let me try to show you what I mean by this. Uh, Edgar, so just a quick yeah. sound check. Eh? Um, if you uh, still have trouble hearing Edgar, could you raise your hand? Okay, there's still a couple of people who have some trouble hearing you. So uh, okay. is there any way that you can improve it? It's mostly fine, but maybe slightly louder, slightly closer. Perfect, thank you. Okay, let me put it awkwardly closer and let me see if that helps. Uh, is it is it sound louder now? Maybe a bit better. Okay. Let's continue. Okay. Thank you. All right, let me try. All right, so when the cat is presented with a retinal image of a stationary cucumber, the cat could be asking the question of like, which of the two possibilities, the cucumber or snake, that could have given rise to the very retinal image. And while cucumber mostly looks like, well, a cucumber, so in this case, we expect the cat will conclude that the image is mostly consistent with the cucumber alone, and therefore there's low uncertainty in this observation. However, when the cat is, uh, cat, when the image is blurred, say due to peripheral vision, or due to the fact that there's not enough time to accumulate evidence as they're caught by surprise, the image could be quite consistent with both the cucumber and snake. And while the cucumber still might be the best guess, there's a much higher uncertainty associated with this visual observation, and the difference in uncertainty could lead to the difference in decision and ultimately the behavior. So a series of experiments on multisensory integration has revealed that both humans and monkeys weigh different information sources according to their reliability, which is the inverse of uncertainty, and do so on a trial by trial basis. And these, while these results provide for strong evidence that the brain encodes and utilizes uncertainty information in arriving at decisions and ultimately behavior, how exactly this uncertainty is represented has not been understood pretty well. Now, critical observation is that the neural population response is rather noisy and thus varies significantly even when on the repeated presentation of an identical stimulus, such that any one pattern actually could be consistent with multiple stimulus values as illustrated here with the simulated population response, so oriented stimuli. Unfortunately, a high contrast and therefore low visual uncertainty, neurons selected to this particular stimulus tends to fire vigorously making it relatively straightforward to predict the stimulus that could have given rise to the stereotypical pattern you observe. However, at the lower contrast and therefore greater stimulus uncertainty, neurons tend to fire much less, such that the resulting population pattern, pattern, firing pattern may be consistent with a broader range of stimulus. And we can in fact formalize this notion by computing something called the likelihood function from this population response which is the probability of the observed neuronal population pattern given a hypothesis value of the stimulus. Utilizing knowledge on how cell tends to uh, respond to the stimulus, we can compute the likelihood function for each observed population response. And note that despite the same presentation of identical stimulus, you will still expect different responses and therefore different likelihood function you would decode. 
However, it does tend to be that a high contrast and again, low sensory uncertainty, decoder likelihood function tends to be narrow and center close to the actual stimulus orientation, in this case, negative 15 degrees. However, lower contrast, and again, that's high sensory uncertainty, decoder likelihood function tends to be wider and its peak location can be quite deviated from the true stimulus value. Therefore, likelihood function can actually capture both the best stimulus estimate through the location of the peak and then associated uncertainty via the shape of the likelihood function that and tends to be that the more uncertainty there is, the wider the likelihood function tends to be. And it is precisely this under the theory of probabilistic population code, it hypothesizes that a population of sensory neurons will simultaneously capture both the best sensor stimulus estimate, as well as the associated uncertainty about the estimate by representing likelihood function together, which could be then decoded by downstream brain areas in making the computations, ultimately arriving at decisions and behavior. Therefore, specifically under this hypothesis, the uncertainty information would be captured by the shape of the likelihood function together along with the peak information, or again, still contained within the likelihood function. Now, in an alternative hypothesis, it might be that the B1 population only encodes the best estimate of the stimulus, such as the point estimate of what the stimulus must have been, and any uncertainty information may be captured through a completely independent path that is then only combined in the downstream area to arrive at the decision. So again, in this case, the B1 population only encodes their point estimate. And in comparing these two alternative hypotheses, it is only under the PPC model that we expect the trial by trial fluctuations in the shape of the decoder likelihood function to be actually carrying the uncertainty information that is utilized by the subject to make decisions and therefore be useful in making trial by trial prediction of the subject's behavior. Now in testing the PPC against the alternative hypothesis, it is, it is critical that three criteria are met. First of all, we need a task that requires the use of trial by trial sensory uncertainty to be able to tease apart the alternative hypothesis based on the behavioral outcomes. After all, if the behavior uh, the behavioral task has no dependency on uncertainty, you wouldn't be able to tell apart any difference between different models of uncertainty encoding. We also need a simultaneous population recording as this is a population code operating at the trial by trial basis. And finally, we actually need a very good method to reliably decode the likelihood functions from the each trial from the observed population of responses. And it's been the case that meeting all these criteria, meet all these three criteria simultaneously has been a major challenge to obtaining electrophysiological evidence that can support or disprove the theory of PPC. Given this, my approach is that was exactly to meet these three criteria. First of all, we train Monkey on a task where it's known that the optimal behavior requires the use of trial by trial sensory uncertainty. And as the monkey performs this task, we record from a population of V1 neurons. And furthermore, we devise a new technique to be able to reliably decode the likelihood function over stimulus from the observed population responses. And finally, make use of this information to predict the monkey's trial by trial decision using models with or without the use of a shape of the likelihood function in predicting the monkey's decisions. So again, the step, y in, uh, step one lies in training monkey on a task that requires the use of sensory uncertainty on trial by trial basis. And here we use a task where the objective is to classify an oriented stimulus into one of two uh, learning classes, C equals one or C equals two. And this task has been specifically designed so that the optimal performance requires the use of trial by trial sensory uncertainty information. So here I'd like to quickly demonstrate how the trial goes. At the beginning of each trial, a class is chosen at random with equal probability to be C equals one or C equals two. And each of these classes defines a distribution over stimulus orientation from which the oriented stimulus will be drawn. C equals one shown here in the red defines a narrow Gaussian distribution over the stimulus orientation, where C equal two shown in blue defines a wider Gaussian distribution but still sharing the same mean. So then we present an orientation drawn from the selected classes distribution, obviously without indicating to the monkey which class it was drawn from. 
over the course of long months of training, the monkey has learned these two class, uh, classes of distribution well, such that they can take the orientation and respond to indicate which of the two distributions or two classes it believed that the orientation was drawn from. Now, a critical twist that I'll also get back shortly is that we also vary the contrast of the stimulus from trial to trial. Now, if you're like monkey and you're trying to go for the maximum amount of juice reward, you want to be as optimal as possible in performing this task. And it turns out to be optimal, all you have to actually do for the case of no noise is to look at the two distributions, see where they meet, draw a decision boundary there and respond C equals one for any orientation that looks to be between the decision boundaries and C equals two elsewhere. However, real life is a bit more complicated than that in that your observation is always a bit noisy such that for any one stimulus presented, your observed orientation actually forms a distribution around it. And this is particularly worse at the lower contrast where your noisy distribution becomes wider. The net effect is that your observed distribution of stimulus is always wider, especially at the lower contrast and comes with this the movement of the joining point and therefore the decision boundary. Hence, if you wanna keep being optimal at performing this task, you actually have to adjust your decision boundary on trial by trial basis according to your perceived sense of uncertainty. And this is the basis for saying that this task requires the use of uncertainty information to perform optimally. So now we have a monkey successfully trained on this kind of task that requires uncertainty. It is also time, it is time to obtain population response from V1. We've implanted 10 by 10 multi-electoral Utah array in paraphobial V1 allowing us to obtain up to 96 multi-units recording simultaneously. We then take the responses during the presentation of the stimulus and collapse it down to a single vector that is the total spike counts over the stimulus presentation duration, which is now used in the subsequent set of decoding likelihood functions on each trial. Now, traditional methods make, tends to make strong parametric assumptions about how stimulus tends to give rise to the responses, something known as the generative model, typically captured as pre of R, the responses condition on the stimulus. A common choice includes estimating the tuning curves, which is also the same thing as stimulus condition expected responses, along with a simple noise model, such as independent Poisson. And while such assumption tends to allow you to compute likelihood function from the responses fairly straightforwardly, there's always a concern that using wrong assumptions can lead to biases in the decoder likelihood functions and subsequently biasing your results of the study. Well, given this realization, um, rather than employing strong assumptions about the generative model with the possibility of biasing my outcomes, I sought to develop a novel deep neural network based methods to directly learn to decode the likelihood functions from the population response. At first, it sounded like a crazy idea. Maybe it was just over application of my belief of deep neural network, but it actually turns out that you could actually achieve this and rather simple, rather, rather simply so. So here's a quick explanation of how this might work out. So if you could assume that there is such a network that can approximate here in this case, a discretized version of the likelihood function from any observed response R. Because you're an experimenter who controls the stimulus, you actually would know a prior distribution over the stimulus S, such that you can combine with this approximate likelihood to compute a posterior over the stimulus condition on the response you just observed. Now, it is actually well established from the deep neural network training and classification tasks such that, such that the posterior estimate can actually be trained to approach the true underlying posterior through the losses such as cross entropy loss against the actual stimulus S that was presented to obtain the response in the first place. Hence, by the reversal of the logic, by making this final posterior approach the true posterior as close as possible, you can actually show them that the output of your network can approximate the actual uh, desired likelihood function up to a multiple, multiplicative constant for each value of R, which for any particular R, it will still give you the correct ratio or correct distribution shape as for over the stimulus, which is what you actually want to be able to perform this analysis. So finally, with a good method of being able to decode likelihood function, the last step lies in comparing models to predict monkeys trial by trial decisions. Again, under the full likelihood model corresponding to the probabilistic population code theory, 
the likelihood function is decoded from trial to trial using the deep neural network from the D1 population that I just described. And in this case, we expect both the center and the shape of the likelihood function to change from the trial to trial as it reflects the random fluctuations in the response of the V1 population. Now, in an alternative model or non-PPC model, V1 population only provides for the best estimate of the stimulus, and thus uncertainty information wouldn't be represented by the shape of the likelihood function, even if you can decode this. Given this, when you actually consider trials coming from a fixed same contrast, there's actually no reason to believe that the uncertainty information should be captured, uh, should vary from trial to trial. In other words, there's the expected level of fixed uncertainty as long as you only consider trials from the same contrast. And here to actually make this model still as powerful as possible, we also formulate this as a deep neural network based model where a fixed shape of the likelihood function for each contrast is learned, here in this case shown as L0, L sub zero, while there's a, another part of the network that learns how to shift this likelihood function based on the population response, equivalently obtaining the best point estimate from the population response as this non-PPC theory will hypothesize. This backpropagatable shift in like light shift in likelihood function uh, of designated peak location is achieved via the use of spatial transformer network that's been initially introduced in the spatial transformer network paper by Yadavar et al. in 2015. So given there's across trials of the same contrast, only the center of the likelihood function will shift while the shape remains the same. Now, since this is fairly critical, I do want to drive this point strong uh, to make it further clear. Let me consider trials from the same contrast under both models and what you could expect to see. Under the full likelihood model, we expect both the center and the shape of the likelihood function to change from the trial to trial. Whereas in the alternative fixed uncertainty model, again, corresponding to non-PPC hypothesis, you would expect only the best point estimate extracted from the V1 responses to change from trial to trial, while a fixed degree of uncertainty as captured by fixed shape of likelihood function is utilized as long as you're only looking at trials from the same contrast. With these two models of uncertainty encoding, these are then fed into a Bayesian decision maker model, which utilizes the knowledge of the task as well as the prior over classes to compute the posterior over stimulus classes, yielding a trial by trial prediction of the monkey's choices. Now, again, critically, if the trial by trial fluctuations in the shape of the likelihood function that you can decode from beyond population is what actually carries the uncertainty information and utilized by the decision making process as the theory of PPC will predict, we expect the full likelihood model and only the full likelihood model contain this additional information about the shape of the likelihood function to be able to better predict monkey's trial by trial decision. So obviously now what follows is the main results. In comparing the two models, I plotted the difference in the performance taking the performance of fixed uncertainty model to be the zero line. Across both monkeys and over wide range of contrast values, we've seen that the full likelihood model successfully yields better trial by trial predictions of the monkey's decision. This in turn suggesting that the trial by trial fluctuations in the shape of the likelihood function appears to be carrying uh, as carried by the full likelihood model is indeed informative about the monkey's trial by trial decision as will be predicted by the theory of PPC. Now, however, there's a bit of always, there's a bit of twist, uh, there's always a bit of a twist. And in that, when we actually now look at the decoder likelihood function, say the sum surrogate of the shape, such as the width, as a function of the orientation, we actually observe that, that on average, the shape of the likelihood function shows dependency on the stimulus orientation. This actually could suggest that the only reason the full likelihood model is performing better than the fixed uncertainty model may simply because it's able to capture the stimulus condition average shape of the likelihood function, thanks to its flexibility, and not so because that the trial by trial fluctuation in likelihood of shape is actually what matters, as we initially originally hypothesized based on the theory of PPC. So to rule this out and further isolate the effect of trial by trial likelihood shapes on the predicted performance, we shuffled only the shape of the likelihood function among trials with identical contrast as well as identical stimulus orientation 
but adjusted the, the resulting shuffle likelihood function in such a way that the location of the peak of the likelihood function remains untouched before and after shuffling. This specifically dissociates the trial by trial correlation between the shape and therefore the expected uncertainty information of the likelihood function with the monkey's decision while keeping everything else intact. If the trial by trial fluctuation in the shape of the likelihood function mattered in predicting monkey's behavior, we expect this procedure of dissociation of the shape and decision to cause a significant drop in the performance of the full likelihood model. And indeed, uh, just as a sanity check, this procedure of shuffling ensures that the expected shape conditional stimulus remains untouched. And this also becomes the basis to believe that any model that's not specifically using this uh, shape of the likelihood function fluctuation will not be affected by the shuffling. And here, again, taking zero to be the baseline of fixed uncertainty model actually with and without the shuffling data, we actually observe that the performance of the full likelihood model on the shuffle data is indeed lower. And in fact, it actually becomes quite a bit significantly worse than the fixed uncertainty models. Therefore, the removal of the, the removal of the correlation between the shape of the likelihood function and the decision on trial by trial basis actually appears to remove the critical information that allowed the full likelihood model to outcompete the fixed uncertainty model. All observation very much consistent with what we expected based on the theory of probabilistic population code. All right, so in summary, uh, the main results shown that the trial by trial fluctuations in the shape of the likelihood functions are indeed informative about the monkey's trial by trial decisions on the task, which in turn leads to the significance or the statement about that the first, this provides for the first population level electrophysiological evidence in support of the hypothesis that the population of V1 neurons indeed seem to appear to encode uncertainty in the form of the likelihood function and on the trial by trial basis thereby lending support to the theory of probabilistic population code. Oops, sorry. All right, so with that, uh, as for everything, no work can be done without a great team of collaborators. And I'd like to thank, uh, take the time to thank specifically SINS lab from University of Tübingen, Andreas Tolius lab from Houston, Texas, and of course, the uh, Leiji Mao lab in NYU. And with that, I think we're ready to open up for questions and discussions. Thank you so much, Edgar. Um, there are currently three uh, questions in the Q&A. All right, let me see if I can look at it. Um, can everybody see uh, the questions? You should be able to. <coughs> awesome. Yes. Um, <coughs> yeah, we just have people um, like sp speak their questions out loud if they are comfortable. Okay, so the, the first question is from Mike Landy. Mm -hmm. Mike. Hey. Mike Landy, so, yeah. You guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, no, I mean, what I said is the question, which is the dumb model that I much more understand than having this uh, DNN in between is the independent neuron Poisson firing rate measured tuning curve. Did you run that model? And did it also outperform the fixed model? Yes. So the answer is yes. I ran the model and I'm actually trying to find that. Yeah, there it goes. So on top of the, the standard tuning curve, uh, I hope the screen is still showing. Ooh, so on top of the standard tuning curve plus independent Poisson noise, uh, Poisson noise model that I basically established as the very baseline for a person point, I've also ran against uh, more of the uh, slightly fancy version of obviously the Poisson like distribution. And here, those are shown on the, uh, on the panel here is the result from both monkeys, the two monkeys, and comparing them as a performance across contrast. So shown in red, uh, so I still keep that the zero line corresponds to the fixed uncertainty model, and the blue is the full likelihood model that I used in my main results. And then the red corresponds to the result of the independent Poisson plus tuning curve, and then green corresponds to the Poisson-like uh, distribution-based uh, assumption for decoding the likelihood function. What's Poisson like mean? The Poisson like actually refers to a distribution class that is linearly sufficient statistics. So it will take the form of the exponential of the, like some kernel dotted with the response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the distribution that was put forward in the uh, way she's making neuroscience 2006 methods. Right, but, but still, still independent. 
That's so actually that has a, a bit better than independence, uh, but it's very, very particular and not necessarily too flexible form of the correlation it can account for. Uh, the it's reason that it's independent is because the pre factor in front of the exponent can be dependent on the entire factor. So that, that's coupling the neurons. Okay. And so do you have any kind of feel for what the DNN is making use of that goes beyond exponential like this Poisson like distributions? Mm. Uh, no, so to be honest, it's not so much that we actually look into the, the, the DNN to see what is the nature of the distribution or anything like that. So in a sense, I don't, I'm not so much. Uh, it it's also not entirely me. obvious how to study that, but so we, we, we're welcoming suggestions. Absolutely. Uh, we could. I mean, there are some analysis that might be of interest. For example, we look in to see, okay, ultimately which neuron contributed to the most in terms of the with different aspects of the decoder likelihood function to see maybe potentially disjoint set of neurons account for different aspects of the likelihood function. I'm trying to pull that piece out. Uh, yeah. But I can already basically mention that they're using, so here to be able to study this, we obviously given this a deep neural network, we have to go for different kinds of deep neural network based analysis techniques. So here we, for example, use a method of attribution that basically asks the question of like what neuron as an input in terms of response contributes the most in changing particular aspect of the output. So for example, the mean or the peak location of the likelihood function or the uh, st standard deviation of the likelihood function. And here is what this one is trying to show. I can actually show that. Um, but I mean, without necessarily going into details, uh, what we've seen is that there seems to be always a high overlap in that neuron that contributes for the center of the likelihood information is always, almost always seems to be contributing towards the shape itself, which meets the idea that there seems to be like one population that is always providing the information in its entirety in the form of the likelihood function. But again, this is not necessary to say anything about exactly what is the form of the distribution. We'll move to the next question uh, for our many L. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Edgar, for the talk. Uh, so my question is uh, performance of the full likelihood model relative to the fixed uncertainty model is significant in the results, uh, but the value is 0 0.02, if I read correctly. So is mm -hmm. it a big difference in terms of predicting the monkey's decision? And uh, what, more broadly, could you interpret this uh, number? Yes, let me, I hope that I have the slide for this. Uh, it might actually be that I failed to include that very one slide. So indeed, the, obviously as you stated and noted, the difference is statistically significant, but the question is like, it, while statistically significant to tell it apart, does it actually still mean big enough of a difference for us to find it interesting? Uh, so one way by which we approach that question is to say like, well, if the true underlying model was actually as we hypothesized uh, in the case, like the full likelihood model, and if you were to simulate the whole experiment, basically use my model as the simulated monkey to go through all the experiments and generating responses. And now we take that as the ground truth data to fit uh, refit everything back. Like what could have been the expected, uh, expected figure or expected uh, size of the diff uh, size of the effect between the full likelihood model and fixed uncertainty model? So that's kind of the, that with the expectation that that is to form like the best possible scenario of we know the ground truth is for likelihood model. That's the, what the data generated based on. Would it have been much much better performant in say fixed uncertainty model if the ground truth is indeed full likelihood model? Uh, and so I, I really regret not having this immediately ready. It's in the paper ready uh, as a supplemental figure. But basically what that showed was that the, the size of the effect for even for the best case scenario, uh, simulated data is actually very comparable in magnitude to the very difference we saw. And it is indeed always small, but it suggests that the, the small difference is in, in fact the best you can actually hope for, uh, even in the case you actually know exactly the underlying model. All right, so the next question is by Adam, but Adam doesn't have a microphone, so I'm going to just read the question. Sure. Uh, was it necessary to have the two classes in a task overlap? Could you have performed this study using non-overlapping classes, uh, a task like in a classes like in random dots? Um, so the answer to that is uh, yes, it's, it was important that the classes overlap. Um, and the reason is that you want a task where uncertainty is actually 
a bit wavy, you just break up. Okay, assuming that it's not me, my connection issue, I'll continue with the answer. So yeah, you actually want an overlap because otherwise without with completely non-overlapping distribution, in order to classify between the two, your decision boundaries actually would not be influenced by the actual degree of uh, noise that you actually put into it. So that will actually lead to a task where uncertainty information- Or Bayesian integration tasks. Um, but um, the current task is um, V1 task that just uses a single stimulus uh, and uh, still has this desirable property, which is why we converged on it. Um, the next question is by uh, Abilash. Mm -hmm. Abilash, would you like to ask your question? Okay, um, Edgar, do you want to take it? This uh, read sure, this question. Yeah. yeah, sure. So let me just read uh, the question. Uh, so how is it that the likelihood function actually represented in the spike activity pattern of neurons? And secondly, how can the neurons implement such integration? Um, what is some could be some sort of coincidence detection? Um, yeah. So let me perhaps it, it will help be helpful to actually be showing the likelihood function uh, the network itself. Mm. There it goes, so it's showing the thing. Yeah, so the idea here is that the, by the virtue of the fact that neurons are, the population response is actually noisy in response to the stimulus, any particular response you observe in itself can always be interpreted as a likelihood function over the stimulus that could have caused that response. So what the proposal really goes is not the fact that you can always compute that because that's, pretty much a virtue of just like always statistical true. Like if you have a noisy response, then there's always a way to, there's always a corresponding likelihood function you can compute to ask what stimulus gave rise to it. The suggestion is the rest of the brain actually looks at their own response and has enough internal understandings or well, obviously for lack of a better word, internal reflection on the very form of the noise as it relates to the stimulus, such that it can interpret the response as being representation of the likelihood, a likelihood function. Uh, one thing I do want to highlight here is that while I'm using deep neural network to achieve the likelihood function decoding, this is by no means suggesting that this is what we believe that the brain is actually performing or is, is whether it even actually has an explicit layer that performs the only thing was to just get the likelihood function. This, again, this is serving purely as a tool for us to say what is the actual information content that the response will have about the stimulus and based on it make predictions of well, if it's the case that brain also has a way to account for that expected information content about the stimulus, what would have been the decision? And in turn, therefore, is uh, asking whether brain is able to perform something akin to likelihood function decoding or computation downstream that accounts for such likelihood function. Uh, so given that there's also no clear methodology suggested or mechanism suggestions as to how exactly the rest of the brain might do it, although I can also refer back to, uh, like, for example, uh, in an or hand and waging my paper that you can actually achieve many uh, optimal and optimal computation based on neuronal responses that ultimately is same thing as accounting for likelihood function to achieve various tasks such as including this one without really having to include any sort of uh, too much of a special computation in building a um, realistic network out of neurons. Yeah, so just one quick addition to that. So as long as I've been working on this topic, which is a long, very long time, um, I, I've been getting that question, right? Like which neurons are actually likelihood neurons? And um, the, the answer to that is uh, there are not necessarily likelihood neurons, right? So as Edgar's saying, this is essentially a different language. It's a translation. We're using here a jump between two Marian levels. We're, we're using, we're jumping from the neural level to the algorithmic slash computational level. Uh, where the V1 activity is the neural level and then the likelihood function is the algorithmic slash computational level. So if, if you proceed with a pipeline, that likelihood function then gets fed into a Bayesian model, which, which is a model that lives at the algorithmic computational level. And as Edgar also mentioned, my paper with Amin and many other papers are trying to study how the actual Bayesian computation that's built on top of the primary uh, sensory representation is actually executed, um, but that's not the focus of this paper. Okay, the 
next uh, question is um, Eros. So let's see if we can un unmute Eros. Eros, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, which question am I asking? Because I, I stuck in two and I even have a third. Uh, if you look at basic uh, properties. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So you were talking about interpretation of the likelihood function. And as Mike expressed and others, um, a, a source of frustration on, on these kinds of things. By the way, I should start by saying, nice talk. <laughs> and, um, and, and I really um, found very interesting the this method of, of trying to learn a likelihood function um, so now that having been said the frustration is that we don't know what that likelihood function is and i'm wondering if you've done any kind of d detailed comparisons looking at the likelihoods that come out of uh, a simple model like an, a linear nonlinear poisson model and the dnn version is that what you're showing us on the screen that is, yeah, so this is actually the, exactly, the decoded likelihood functions between the full likelihood model, obviously corresponding to the full deep neural network based model, mm -hmm. the Poisson -like, which is actually, we implemented as equivalent of a single layer, neuro, uh, single layer, layer neuro, yeah, neural network, basically LNP based model, and then more essentially the independent Poisson. And so from cases to cases, you do see they deviate, which obviously has to be the case to be able to serve as a difference between predictions. But as far as like systematic explanation for it, it's not definitely something we study for too much to be able to say, this is a particular feature that the full likelihood model tends to capture that's lacking from say LNP based or that is a Poisson-like model. So you don't think there's nothing systematic that was obvious to you when you looked at this, like they're not generally wider or biased in one direction or anything like that. Not that we could observe. And in fact, on average, all methods appears to do a pretty decent job in getting the mean response of the likelihood function to align with the actual stimulus. Uh, so it appeared to be the case that basically at high order moments, so everything but the mean must be critical, but nothing to the point that I can say there's been, as you said, no systematic bias or no systematic observation about the complexity of the shape. Huh. Thanks. You might as well ask your other question. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I had stuck in another question there, which was just, let's see, where is it? Oh, this was just following up on Mike's question. Um, when you did the simulation of the LNP model, you made all the tuning curves the same, or you varied them with orientation as uh, in some way that matches what we see in visual cortex? Because the tuning curves tend to be narrower at the cardinal axes, then uh, there, there are more cells at the cardinal axes with narrower tuning curves. So I imagine this is for the simulation that uh, for the like the best case performance difference you're talking about. Yeah, I'm losing context a little bit here, but I guess it was this was coming off of Mike's question. I was trying to do a follow up. Okay, so I, in that case, then it must have been the fitting of the independent Poisson model, I suppose. So in yeah. that case, there's no simulation because what I do is per neuron, I fit the tuning curve uh, using Gaussian process regression. So there's actually none of that is based on simulation. Uh, but if it's actually referenced to say, for example, the, the establishment of whether if the ground truth was the full likelihood model, what would we actually recover if you want to rerun the experiment with that? There actually the simulation was still based on the fitted data from the actual analysis. So again, like even in case of using tuning curve kind of analysis is still fitted to the data. I think one point that which hasn't been part of the talk or haven't covered, but um, since it does strike the simulation part that I do want to mention is that in verifying the method of the deep neural network based likelihood decoder, I've indeed tried this on a simulated response. And there I must say that the, I did not incorporate any sort of dependency of the tuning curve shapes uh, based on the central location or central orientation preference. Uh, but I, I wouldn't have expected that to yield to, uh, lead to different results. Okay, we're going to the next question by James Wilmot. Uh, what role do you believe learning of the task requirements played in observing your results? Would you expect to observe orientation and contrast dependent likelihood function shapes when the monkey is first beginning to learn the task? Do you have any data on this time period? Yeah, so uh, it, this is a particularly interesting one. And I will start with the last point first. 
and that unfortunately not. This is one of the points that I sincerely hope that we, I could have actually made a recording during the course of the monkey training. Uh, I do have my excuse basically that we tend to train the monkey for months after months and only after it pretty much reached a perfection, then we perform the surgery in the hope of never losing any time of recording during the time where monkey might still be learning the task, which since it's always uncertain how long it would take a monkey to get to completion. Uh, that being said, it's, I believe the learning must have played a, a critical role, or I must in some sense, in the sense of that it would have affected what we observe quite significantly if you were to observe this through the course of the training. But first of all, for example, in decoding the trial by trial decisions from the likelihood function, I'm trying to find the relevant slide for that. Uh, sorry, not that one. Uh, one of the critical thing we do is to assume, one second, does it actually work? There. So here we actually make use of Bayesian decision maker. And this assumes that the monkey has learned the majority of the task requirements. That's the only way by which we could actually make predictions as to if the likelihood function representation over stimulus was what we decoded, what it should have led in terms of decision. So given if you were to perform this during the training, I would have expected that since monkey hasn't quite internalized the task structure, this could have very well led to very, very variable response and very, very variable decision, uh, which if you try to stick to the assumption that they learned the task, we could be very well off. Uh, another thing obviously would be interested in how some, somehow effects like stimulus prior can actually factor in in terms of the decision predictions or even in terms of the likelihood function uh, as there's always a lingering idea of whether early visual areas is strictly encoding for stimulus driven likelihood function or there's any factor of learning in terms of learning the prior the distribution that ends up influencing the way the population responds. So the next question is by uh, Manos. Um, you assume perfect integration during the trial. Is this realistic given the neural data and trial duration? And would a possible leak be of relevance affecting differently low or high contrast? So I'm assuming in terms of like you're saying like whether there would have been like a like trial like sequence trial sequence effect on the uh, on the results. Is that, uh, I'm, I'm interpreting this as within trial, like, um, but I'm not hundred percent sure. Maybe the evidence effect or some lower high contrast. So is it accumulation um, of evidence? Sorry. I'm interpreting as, as, a, as a question about to what extent is accumulation of evidence uh, important in this task and is this differential between uh, contrast levels? Uh, I see, I see. So unfortunately, I think part of the task the design uh, hasn't really led us to be able to do like very much of like different time slice analysis. It's just the sheer fact that uh, if you were to not integrate across the whole stimulus presentation, we were not able to get to a particularly high counts that's reliable enough to be able to decode inflammation. Definitely puts a limitation on like how fine of a slice we can perform. That being said, in the paper, I do touch upon like analyzing the first 250 milliseconds of accumulation versus the last 250 milliseconds of accumulation to see whether there's any indication of the timing at which the likelihood function becomes ready to present, so to speak. And in that case, actually between those two rough halves comparison, we didn't really see a significant effect, um, which is definitely not to say that if you were to be able to do this at a much finer time scale, then we might have seen that the likelihood function continuously still, uh, may, still changes over time uh, uh, towards the beginning, especially for lower contrast. Uh, and actually along the spirit, there's even like more recent work that was presented last year in the CCN where we tried to extend the framework to be able to account for changing likelihood function over the course of the duration of a trial. Um, that's more of a theoretical development than the work. Next question is um, by Abilash. Um, if one were to speculate and suggest to experimentalists what to look for at the implementational level, for example, downstream, that's my uh, addition here. What would be your educated guess? Uh, for example, some kind of coincidence detection or anything else? Mm, that's interesting. So mechanistically, whether this will suggest anything. Um, hmm. I guess so, one part mm -hmm. of the answer here is uh, something that we're actually trying to do right now, which is simultaneous recordings from D1 and PFC. Uh, because PFC neurons 
presumably would encode the category decision. And the interesting question is, is, they all, is if they also encode uh, the posterior probability of the category and whether uh, the activity of such uh, posterior uh, associated neurons uh, could be predicted by the trial to trial likelihoods uh, that we're decoding from V1, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, this is not necessarily answering your question in the sense of dissecting the circuit in between V1 and PFC, um, but it would answer the question of whether this information, uh, this uncertainty information captured in likelihood uh, passes through PFC and changes format there in preparation for a category decision. Yeah, and I can also extend a bit on the form of the, even maybe like directly on the implementation as well. Uh, not to say there's a particular suggestion I have about the architecture quite yet, but one of the works that I definitely didn't cover with this is to study, I want, what I do is in the system identification, trying to see exactly how stimulus ends up being, uh, giving rise to different responses and different brain, brain areas. And on top of that, also look at multiple brain areas to see how could one compute the response of another brain area based on the previous brain areas. So work like that might actually, and that's also being done heavily through the use of machine learning and deep neural networks, but work like that may actually be able to establish a suggested computation that perform, that is occurring in terms of response route level, but which once obtained, then we could actually try to assess what is the effect of such computation, for example, in form of the likelihood functions to try to arrive at, okay, what could be the relevance of this in terms of computation? Is it the change of the variable perhaps, as Weiji was suggesting, if we're going from say V1 to PFC as it goes from maybe stimulus orientation to the category classes, or perhaps as some form of a different level of still the same variable being translated, but some changes in the life of the function, which may or may, may, may not better reflect the behavior. All right, so I think we're uh, done answering the submitted questions. Any other questions that are coming up now, you can just raise your hand. If not, then uh, thanks everybody for coming. If you have any more questions, yeah. please uh, uh, contact us. Uh, our email addresses are easy to find. Yeah. Uh, thank you so far, very much for being with uh, us here today. Take yeah. care. Thanks so much for that. Bye-bye.